Yeah. How fast can you solve the Rubik's Cube? Felix Zemdex here managed to solve this one in just 4.73 seconds, setting the world record at that time. Oh! Oh! I can't compete with that, but maybe my computer could, if we redefine fast a little bit. Instead of time, let's measure the number of moves it takes to solve a cube. And let's find an algorithm that will help us solve any cube the fastest, thereby, in a way, beating Felix Index. You'll see that the algorithm will lead us to a surprisingly general technique that can also be used for completely different things, such as breaking ciphers. So stick with us. So our problem is as follows. Imagine I give you a Rubik's Cube and ask you to solve it in the lowest number of moves possible. Okay, first we actually need to define what we mean by move. For simplicity, let's say we never rotate the cube as a whole, so the middle squares always stay in the same place. Then, a move only rotates one side of the cube. The top, bottom, left, right, front or back. Each of the sides can be rotated to three new positions, so that gives us 18 possible moves in total. From the scramble that Felix was given, you can solve the cube in 18 moves. Of course, Felix's solution was longer and used 43 moves. That's actually quite wasteful. In fact, we know every cube can be solved in at most 20 moves. It took people until 2010 to prove this, more than 30 years after the invention of the Rubik's Cube. The proof was done using a computer program. You can find out more on this webpage with the bombastic headline of God's number is 20. Alright, so now let's try to design an algorithm to find the shortest solution for a scramble. Here's a useful way to view this problem. The possible configurations of the cube form a vast network with two nodes being connected if there is a move from one to the other. In computer science, we call such networks graphs and their connections edges. Graphs tend to pop up often since they can represent very diverse concepts such as road networks, friendships in a social graph, or in our case, an abstract network of configurations. Here you're only seeing a tiny part of the neighborhood of the solved cube. Remember, every cube has 18 neighbors in the full graph. Okay, that's nice and all, but how do we connect all this to the problem we were originally trying to solve? Well, solving a specific configuration just amounts to finding the shortest path in the graph from the scrambled configuration to the solved one. And how do we find this shortest path? The first solution that comes to mind is to start from the scrambled configuration and run the so-called breadth-first search algorithm. Simply put, this algorithm explores the configurations ordered by their distance from the scrambled cube. It keeps blindly searching like this until it encounters the solved cube. Problem solved then, right? Well, there is a small issue. A quick Wikipedia search reveals that the number of possible Rubik's Cube configurations is about 43 quintillion. That's about 10 to the 20, so in the worst case, our algorithm will have to explore about 10 to the 20 configurations until it finds a solution. Since a regular computer can explore about 10 to the 6 configurations per second, this would take millions of years. Assume we're not patient enough to wait a million years, and we'd like the solution in a few days at most. In that time, we could explore about 10 to the 10 cube configurations. So sadly, the simple solution doesn't cut it. Let's take a step back and think about what else we could do. Feel free to pause the video as well. In our graph, we have no clear sense of direction. It's hard to tell which move will get us closer to the solution. Because of that, we have to rely on breadth-first search to blindly explore the neighborhood of our cube. Let's have a closer look at what actually happens when we do that. Starting from the solved cube, breadth-first search first explores these 18 configurations that we can reach with one move. Okay, now let's see where two moves can get us. Ooh, now there's already 243 configurations. Also notice that some of them can be reached in more than one way. Hmm, so what happens after three moves? We'd love to show you, but there's already more than 3000 configurations. That's way too many to fit on the screen. So clearly, the number of configurations grows very quickly. It looks like every step multiplies it by about 10. A bit more in the beginning and a bit less at the end, 
but it makes sense to assume that the number of configurations reachable in n steps is about 10 to the n. That's actually a very special property. Not all graphs have this exponentially fast growth. Let's illustrate that by comparing with a road network graph. Consider this network of crossroads in Manhattan. Here, the number of explored nodes only grows quadratically. After n steps, we explore exactly 2n squared plus 2n plus 1 nodes, which is roughly the same as 2n squared. In 5 steps, that makes 61 nodes, whereas for the Rubik's Cube, it's hundreds of thousands. In this regard, the Rubik's Cube graph is very similar to friendship graphs. By that, I mean graphs where the nodes are people, and two nodes are connected if the corresponding people are friends. Example, at the beginning of the video, we showed you a clip from a speed cubing competition. There may have been about 50 people there. And the friendship graph of this competition could have looked something like this. Now, recall the excited gentleman from the clip. Well, it turns out if you start from him and only take three steps, you visit all 50 people in the network. In more human terms, if you take anybody at the competition, like Felix here, the excited guy knows him through at most two intermediate friends. There's a famous generalization of this phenomenon called six degrees of separation. It says that you can reach almost any person on earth through just six intermediate friends. Obviously, you can't really check that, but researchers have verified that on Facebook, you can reach pretty much anybody through just four intermediate friends. If you think about it, it actually makes sense. Since the average person has around 200 Facebook friends, the number of people reached will be multiplied by a hundred-ish in every step. Okay, that was a long detour. Let's get back to actually solving the Rubik's Cube. If you remember, we found that the problem was that we need breadth-first search to go to distance 20, but it would take a million years to do that. If we want the program to finish in our lifetime, we can only afford to go to distance 10. That only gets us halfway to the solve cube, and the other half is much more computationally expensive. We could also try searching from the solved cube, but since the situation is symmetrical, we run into the same issue. Well then, is all hope lost? Not quite. Although going from either side doesn't cut it, we can go from both. That's because these two balls must intersect. That means there's a configuration in the middle that we know how to reach from both sides. If that were not the case, the two cubes would have to be more than 20 moves apart, and we know that's impossible. Great, so let's turn that insight into an algorithm. Instead of searching from one side and trying to reach the other, we'll search from both sides at once and stop once we meet in the middle. When that happens, there is a configuration that we know how to reach both from the solved cube and the scrambled one. So we can simply combine these two partial paths to get a full solution. It also must be the shortest one. We'll leave the proof of that up to you. This trick is called meet in the middle for obvious reasons. And it's a lot better than what we had before. Since we have to explore up to distance 10 from either side, we see about two times 10 to the 10 configurations, whereas the original search needed to explore up to 10 to the 20. Now, we could run this algorithm for other graphs, not just the Rubik's Cube graph. But for it to work, it's really crucial that the number of explored nodes grows exponentially in the number of steps. That ensures that if we walk half the distance, we only see a tiny fraction of the nodes. If we were to run meet in the middle in the Manhattan graph, it wouldn't help us at all, because it might happen that we end up exploring all the nodes anyways. So far, we've only talked about how fast the algorithm runs, but there is another important aspect if we want to actually code this algorithm. Memory. Storing the necessary 10 billion states takes about hmm, 80 gigabytes. So to actually run the algorithm, we had to use a computer from our university's cluster that has this kind of memory. It found the solution in about four hours, which is pretty quick. Check out our code in the description. It has a few more optimizations that we didn't talk about here. There's also a bit about state-of-the-art algorithms for solving the Rubik's Cube. They exploit some more specific properties of the cube graph, which allows them to be even faster. As I've mentioned, the meet-in-the-middle trick can also be used to solve other problems. Let me quickly mention another application that doesn't involve graphs of any kind. In the 1970s, people came up with a cipher called DES, which stands for Data Encryption Standard. 
It was the standard cipher that everyone was using at that time. This cipher is a so-called symmetric cipher, and these generally work as follows. First, you come up with a secret key that's just a binary string of 56 bits. The cipher itself consists of two functions. There's the encryption function, which takes your super secret plaintext and the encryption key, and it produces a ciphertext, which to the naked eye just looks like a jumbled sequence of characters. And the decryption function reverts this process, so it takes the ciphertext and the same secret key, and it gives you back the original plaintext. Importantly, this only holds when you use the same key for encryption and decryption. Otherwise, what you get back from decryption is just complete garbage. Today, the DES cipher is no longer considered secure. To see why, let's join the dark side and try to break it. Imagine the scenario of the so-called known plaintext attack. You, the attacker, have somehow obtained both an original plaintext and its encrypted counterpart. Now you want to figure out what the secret key is. Once you have the key, you can use it to decrypt all other messages encrypted with the same key. DES uses a 56-bit key, and that's not a lot these days. You can just try all 2 to the 56 keys. That's 10 to the 17, which is quite a lot, but it's doable if you're the military. For each key, you just check whether encrypting the plaintext with that key gives you back the corresponding ciphertext. If it does, you have your secret key. To defend against this, people came up with a new cipher called triple des. It's simply the old des, but applied three times in a row with three different keys, which gives a key of combined length of 168 bits. Okay, so we have this, and then there's triple this, but whatever happened to double this? I mean, we could just apply the cipher two times, first to get an intermediate encrypted message, and then encrypting it once again with a different key. That would give us a key of combined length of 112 bits, that's 10 to the 34 possible keys, and that's way too much for the same brute force approach to work. But surprisingly, double this is not at all safer than the ordinary this. Again, let's say you know a plaintext and its corresponding ciphertext. First, brute force all 2 to the 56 keys and save all possible intermediate encrypted texts. To do this, you will need thousands of terabytes, but remember, you are the military. Then, as with the Rubik's Cube, start working from the other side. Use the decryption function on the ciphertext with all possible keys. Whenever you decrypt the message, try to find it in the huge database that you computed in the first step. And again, iterate over all 2 to the 56 possible keys until you find a match. When that happens, you found the two subkeys used in the cipher. So that's why double des is not a thing. You could try applying this to triple des as well, but the number of subkeys is just way too large. So I hope you can see the common pattern here. In the case of the cube graph, the naive algorithm would have to explore about 10 to the 20 configurations in the worst case, and we managed to reduce that to about 10 to the 10, at the cost of roughly the same number of bytes of memory. And for double this, instead of brute forcing all 2 to the 112 keys, we found a clever solution that reduced this number to only 2 to the 56, again using about the same amount of memory. You might see the common pattern here. The meet in the middle trick is useful when you want to search a large state space with, let's say, n states. If everything goes well, you can reduce the time needed from n to the much better square root of n. But since there is no free lunch, we have to pay for this speedup, and we pay for it by memory. The memory consumed is now also proportional to square root of n, whereas for the naive algorithms, we would only need a very small amount of memory. And there you have it. That was the powerful and general meet-in-the-middle trick that can be used both for solving the Rubik's Cube and for breaking ciphers. If you know other cool applications of this trick, let us know in the comments. If you don't, also let us know in the comments. And of course, remember to like the video and subscribe for more algorithmic goodies. Till next time!